So far, pride of place has been given to industry, and rightly so, because Burnley is proud of its industrial past. But industry is a two-edged sword. It brings prosperity, but it also brings problems. The Trafalgar district of Burnley, earlier this century. It wasn't just the mill chimneys that belched out smoke. Every foundry and workshop had its boilers and smokestack chimney. In addition, there were the railway locomotives, and at one time, even the trams were powered by steam. And it must not be forgotten that each house, thousands of them, had coal fires. The smoke was often so bad that for months on end, one end of the town could not be seen from the other. It was also bad for health, but most women were more interested in the effect of soot on their weekly washing. My mother's wedding day, Monday were all us wedding day, no other day I'd do. And on that day for dinner it were all us slushed and stew. That what joint left over at weekend, we onions and taties thrown in. There were no time to make hotels when old day wedding she'd been. There were no hot water at tap, she'd a big set boiler in back oil. And that were lit as soon as she get up with lumps of wood and coil. And you should have seen that mandel. It'd be as tall as me. And it had great big wood rollers and dolly tub fit under your sea. Then she'd a big wood posser that she shoved up and down it tub. And then she'd get a rubbing board and cloys she'd sew up and rub. By gum, you know them rollers. They took some turning round. Sometimes when you turn that wheel, it nearly lifted your feet off ground. All white said to be boiled, and then the bit starch and dolly blue. My mother must have been worn out when that washing day were through. Theirs were all as filled with steam when we get back for school. And the big cloys hanging bam for it rack, and cloys maidens round fire as a rule. Do you know? Foldens a bit flabbergasted if they could see air automatics today. But by gum, I'll tell you this, I wouldn't like to go back to their way. Houses were crowded within walking distance of the mills, a pattern that was repeated all over the town. Hilltop was an area that was targeted, and not without good cause, for demolition in the 1930s. I was born in George Street in the Meadows in 1922 and uh, lived there till the Meadows were pulled down in about the early 30s, 31. It was dominated by the mills, the high walls. Uh, it was a rough area in the sense of uh, a lot of people living in small houses in uh, a very sh small area. Cobble streets, uh, no toilets, the toilets were top of the street, everybody had their own toilet. Front doors were never locked, but toilet doors were always locked. Now we were very fortunate because we had lino and a small piece of carpet which had to be taken out by hand and shaken. A lot of the houses just had coconut matting, lino, or in many cases, just flags. They were poor. Uh, it showed in the curtains 
you know, uh, I've seen newspapers up the window for months on end, just no curtains, it's only been pawned. Uh, yes, you knew the area was poor, you could see it, you could see the attitude of the people, the hang dog expressions on the people, because they were hungry. Uh, they pawned everything they had. Well, I was 15 when I came into the mill. I had lived on a farm until then, but my dad died, and so we came back up Hall's site, and I had to go and work in the mill. And I lived up a street near the mill, and all the men used to sit outside, and they used to pull my leg when I was going past. Well, I mean, I was that naive, which we were at that age, that uh, they'd shout things out at me. Uh, I was going with a boy at the time, and he was very, very tall, and uh, they used to say, just to take a buffet with her. When I was going with this lad, you see, and that meant to kind of kiss him, you see, and I used to, my face, it used to be blushing. It was terrible, and it didn't matter which way I went, if I went down another street, I'd still to pass those men, so I couldn't get away from it. Houses like these on Burnley Road in the village were occupied by families which spent their working days at the loom. The houses in the row on the right are somewhat larger than others in the village, and they still make very pleasant homes. Just round the corner on Queen Street, near the present museum, these still attractive houses can be found. Notice the cobbled street and the stone-flagged pavement. Most streets in Burnley were like this in years gone by. Very little has been pulled down in Hull Syke, but in Burnley the older slum property has been replaced with council housing. About 2,400 dwellings were built by the council by 1940, and of these some 1,400 were direct replacements for the back-to-backs of the Industrial Revolution. The earliest council housing estates were at Mansurge and Killington Streets in the Lane Head area. They were built by 1913. Then, after the First World War, more were constructed at Rose Hill and Palace House. The most well-known, perhaps notorious is a better word, council housing scheme was without doubt Trafalgar Gardens. It replaced rows and rows of terraced housing off Trafalgar and was Burnley's reluctant response to the housing crisis of the 1960s. The council didn't want to build these terraces in the sky, but the government knew better. Now houses on a human scale are replacing the former open access blocks and Trafalgar now has its own brand new community centre. Over those 30 years or so, community spirit was very much noted by its absence at Trafalgar Let's hope that this can be restored. Elsewhere in Burnley, there are areas of fine Victorian houses. Brooklands Road in Burnley Wood are fine examples of manufacturers' villas. Others can be found at Palatine Square. The houses have gardens, and the people who lived in areas like these surrounded themselves with trees and flowers. If the ordinary weavers and miners couldn't afford luxuries of this kind, they were never far away from a public park. Burnley acquired its parks later than other towns, but there's more parkland in Burnley today than anywhere else in Lancashire. The principal parks are Scott Park, bequeathed to the town by John Hargreaves Scott, who was a member of the family which produced the textile machine, the Spinning Jenny. Queen's Park was the gift of Sir John Thursby, the owner of the Colliery Company. It was opened in 1887, the year of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Thompson's Park, close to the old town centre. It was built on the site of Bank Hall's extensive gardens and was opened in 1930. It was the gift of Mr J. W. Thompson, who was a wealthy cotton manufacturer in town. Today, the Boating Lake remains an attraction, as is the beautiful Italian garden. In the Second World War, Thompson's Park was the only part of Burnley to be hit by a German bomb. The most impressive of Burnley's parks is Townley, where some of the plantings date from the 18th century. At the centre of the park is the magnificent Townley Hall. 
It was the home of the Townley family for over four centuries, and there's a spectacular collection on display to the public. The Long Gallery, with its famous priest hole, the largest in England, is very popular with the children. The kitchen is another place that must be seen. In the chapel, there is this wonderful altarpiece, which was brought to Townley in the 18th century by the great collector Charles Townley. There is so much more to see at Townley, but any visitor would be foolish to leave the place without seeing the art galleries. The most famous painting in the collection is by Zoffany. It's of Charles Townley at his London home, where he's surrounded by his collection much of which is now in the British Museum.